in the first instance, I wish to express my sincere gratitude and uh, indeed a humbling uh, day today for me to achieve, uh, to get this uh, oration award in the name of Professor Dhanan Singh. Uh, Patra, we have uh, Dr. Hami, uh, President of uh, Boss, also the president of uh, the North Atlantic Society, dear friends. Just now, we will refer all Cheshma Laiye was the book that has been written. And uh, refractive surgery has been uh, something which has been close to my heart. And uh, I'll be just going through the journey of refractive surgery, uh, which uh, personally I would say I went on to start in the year 85, 86. Uh, from there on, we have uh, really moved to a large extent to make refractive surgery today the most, I would say the second most commonly performed surgery after cataract surgery in the field of ophthalmology. Though retinal injections are taking uh, the first spot mainly, but I don't call that really a surgery surgery, but uh, I think from a uh, surgical standpoint, cataract surgery still is the maximum number followed by refractive surgery. Now, refractive surgery is not something new. The idea and the concept to change the curvature of the cornea to actually change the refractive power of an individual uh, was given way back in 1896. And uh, Lance first published this in 1896. And then uh, you had Sato who came in to perform incisions on the inside of the cornea with obviously deleterious effects or disastrous effects onto the cardinal endothelium. Uh, and then came on the uh, radial keratotomy that was my figure of etc. Now from there on what one would say is that this is similar to what we are doing today which is the calyx or the lenticular extraction but this was an automated lamellar keratoplasty uh, wherein the lenticule using a blade or a keratome was uh, described by Jose Baraga. And then came on the advent of what is known as the examiner laser or non-sighted eyes for PDK and uh, Theosider performed this in 1985. Uh, went on to the first successful PRK done by Margaret McDonald. Uh, and that was in 1987, again on non-sighted eyes. And then in 1990 came the big revolution by our Pelicaris and uh, from Greece uh, who described the term LASIK. And that was laser in situ keratobiosis. Further developments on PRK coming back to uh, the use of uh, the alcohol to get basic or to also use the epicaratome uh, came in and then you had the first procedure of SMILE that was performed by Skindo in 2007 and then there have been uh, advances in the uh, refractive arena in the area of lenticule extraction. So if you look at refractive surgery, the evolution you can say from the stone age, uh, we have gone on to the present day of automotive as you can see in the evolution of how the rollers on which you would uh, roll on, that is the tire which is today which you have in the sports car. So you had the RK, you had the PRK which is there and then you had the micro keratome. I still remember there used to be a waiting period to buy a Hansatone. Uh, it uh, would, uh, we had to wait for more than a year and a half to actually get our hands on a Hansatone. And not one dollar less than sixty thousand dollars was the cost of the Hansatone at that particular time. And from there on we got one to the second laser. Uh, which uh, again we were uh, able to lay our hands in the year 2005, uh, 2006 and then we came on to what is known today as Calyx. So today if you look at refractive surgery, refractive surgery offers to the patient unhindered, unencumbered vision. That is the kind of uh, outcome that a person is uh, wanting and with today's occupation and most of us becoming potato pouches or looking at the computer or the phones the incidence of myopia is really galloping and there are even a lot of occupations where persons do not want to wish to have glasses. So today, uh, obviously there are several ways that you go and attack the refractive uh, outcomes to get the refractive outcome of hematropia and you have these outcomes on the cornea and you have it on the lens and these are the particularly various options which are being done. And what I would say is that if you have to be a refractive surgeon, you should be able to lay your hands on everything. Uh, you should be able to also look at the complications that are there 
and you should be alive to all these things that are there. It is not that any patient who comes to you, you would fit a LASIK, but it is depending upon what suits the patient, you have to choose the procedure which is there for that particular thing. Now, when you look at radial keratotomy, there was the Russian way of doing radial keratotomy and there was the American way of doing radial keratotomy, going from out in or coming from in out. Uh, that is what it was, but you know that it was a most uh, I would say less uh, it was a less perfect technique, there were a lot of imperfections and we are getting a lot of patients now with uh, late hyperopic shifts and fluctuation in millions. so this was obviously about the complications and the imperfections it was discarded. Then came in what was known as the PRK and again because PRK was not something where there was spontaneity, everyone wants spontaneity, uh, one would remove the epithelium and do the excitement laser and then the epithelium uh, with the excitement laser you would alter the cornea to a particular level. I think there has been a resurgence into the surface ablation which has been there. And these complications I think with the use of bandage contact lens which is now a given when we used to do when we started doing in 97. Uh, we didn't put a bandage contact lens. The patients were really uncomfortable like you have and the epithelialization could be delayed etc. And you could get infections. And then came in the advent of things small little things change and then the advent of mitomycin C where nowadays everyone uses mitomycin C to reduce the haze and the regression which was known in these particular cases and the use of uh, 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 NSA soap uh, bandage contact lens uh, that would reduce the pain component to an individual. And then came what was the LASIK and LASIK as you would say how would it score over the PRK was that the patient recovery was pretty fast. Uh, there was less post-operative pain and post-operative haze was not there because the uh, the basement and the moments were not disrupted by uh, by the laser which was there. Now, in the case when you are doing a LASIK surgery, there was the, the flap that needed to be created and this flap was earlier created by microkeratome. As I told you, Hansatome was one of the best uh, earlier keratomes that came in and then you could do it with a femtosecond laser. Now, uh, there are several uh, keratomes that I still believe that this is one of the fantastic techniques of creating uh, a keratome. When we got the Hansotome or when this came, it was thick, meaty flaps. In a Hansotome, you would get a 160 and a 180 head. And it is only over time when that we realized that we could go down and nowadays with the flaps that you do are 110 or 130 or you can even go to uh, a 90 micro on the head and what is important when you are doing this LASIK is to cut wet and to ablate dry because if you have humidity, if you have uh, the uh, kind of uh, the uh, there is fluid onto the cornea, the ablation would be less and simultaneously in the diver laser you know that there were improvements from a broad beam, a summit autonomous uh, summit uh, laser and the physics were too and the beams were this huge and you would get what is known as cold spots. None of you people would have seen because from the broad beam, uh, it went on to the final, which is uh, which is the flying spot technology. And with the flying spot technology came in the centration and the cyclotorsion compensation and the eye trackers. The eye trackers needed to be faster than the speed of the laser, and therefore you are getting much better and excellent results. Now from the uh, next thing which came was the femtosecond laser and the femtosecond, what exactly is a femtosecond laser? A femtosecond laser is a photo disruptive laser slash an excimer laser which is a photo ablative laser. So for a photo ablative laser you need a surface for the ablation to happen and that is why it is the raw surface where the ablation happens but when you have a photo, uh, when you have a photo disruptive laser which is a femtosecond, it is a very high energy spot that is hit. You can hit it in any plane of the cornea provided the cornea is transparent. When it hits, it creates plasma and this plasma when it is put next to each other creates a layer or creates a cleavage plane that you can separate. So this actually then became a femtosecond where the where the flap thickness from a 160, 180 went down to 100, 110 or 120 and you have the uh, flap which is, uh, you have the bed and you have the side cut which is cut and this takes about 12 to 16 seconds for you to make this particular cut. And once you have this, uh, all you have to do is to go into the cleavage plane, you have to go into the entry. Once you have gone into the entry, you can see that uh, the, uh, the you go in with a, uh, it's a reasonably blunt spatula that you go in 
and you just can lift it and uh, you get fantastic clear uh, demarcations that you have that means that the cleavage plane is very good and you can see it seems to be far more forgiving because even if you have some problem you can either abort the procedure or re -talk at that particular time and redo the procedure of the ablation uh, of the uh, cutting. Now from the conventional LASIK to the blade free LASIK we have come on to a technology which is now called as KLEX. KLEX is something which is a single step procedure which has been coined only as a globally accepted word in only in 2023 because before that you had every company coming up with a name you had a smile, you have now a smile pro, you had a silk, you had a clear, uh, you had an ATOS etc etc so the, the common name that is there is a lenticular keratorefractive lenticular extraction procedure which is called as a KLEX uh, which I think is something important that one has to uh, kind of remember that this I would say uh, we, uh, I, I would put my money on this maybe 10 years ago which I did and today I feel this is the way the journey which is there and every machine has improved significantly. I think uh, these, uh, the Silk Pro, uh, the, the Smile Pro, uh, the Silk etc. they are all giving you great things. But whenever you are looking at where we are today, you need to study the past if you would define the future. I am not the one, this is uh, the quote by your futures, I am not the one who was born in the possession of knowledge. I am the one who is fond of antiquity and earnest in seeking it there. Learning without thought is labor loss. Thought without learning is perilous. So that is, uh, let's just look at the uh, journey. Uh, 2004, uh, that is when Segundo and the team from the Carl Zeiss, they had, they started working on the uh, piglets on to the various uh, uh, ways as to how it is. This is how protocol of a femtosecond laser was and this is how they looked at there is always a lot of work that goes into this particular thing. Uh, optometrists came forward actually to do the clinical trial just to get onto the suction. And the same thing is being done today from a two-piece PI of a silk to a single-piece PI. It is the uh, paramedical staff who have volunteered to look at how the single-piece PI is working. So this was from the School of Optometry in Karl Zina and this is how it looked at and this is the first kind of uh, study which was looked at. Uh, you would see a central this thing, a flattening in the center which you expect which was right um, centered and this is how a femtosecond machine uh, for doing the lenticule looked at. 2005-06 uh, you have human studies of blind eyes. Uh, that's uh, where it is you looked at uh, patients with CRPO, CRAO, embryopic eyes and the first seeing eye was treated on May 3, 2006. So friends it's almost going to be two decades since the first was and then you can obviously see the evolution that have happened in this particular thing. When the concept came, the concept was to create a lenticule to take away the use of an excimer laser but it was a full flap that was created and the lenticule was then peeled off. So that was the earlier concept it was there and this was with a use of a 200 kilohertz. When femtoseconds came it started from 15, 50, 100, 200 and you would say transient light sensitivity, DLK, lot of problems which were there but then all these evolutions happened. 2007 was the birth of smile and this is the smile of the calyx which uh, my previous speakers have talked about and you can see that it becomes made it a flapless all femto and a single step procedure. Uh, which was uh, uh, which was really fantastic. These are the four steps which are universal for all machines uh, that you have in the lenticular extraction. Now, mind you, this again India has a contribution. This is Rupal's video uh, of the first uh, silk, oh, sorry, first smile procedure that was done. Now, just watch uh, how people, how uh, the techniques have evolved. This is a 200 hertz laser. So, look at the speed which Sonu was showing a little earlier, or uh, uh, others have shown of the same pro maybe of the hubby etc. You can see the speed at which it is moving. So this was 200 hertz. Now look at and watch another thing. These are small little things which keep on. You can see it went from in and out and now you see it was coming from out to in. Is this the same as today? No, it is the reverse. And why is it reverse? Because there is so much of OBL that comes in the center that the cut is not as fine in the center and therefore the visual recovery was not that fine. Just a small little step of changing the way the laser is coming from outside in from rather from going from uh, outside in from in to out. That means the moment you have done the center first shot, 
you go back again in the center so that the time that is given for the OPI to expand is uh, limited. And this is again, you can see that this is how it will work forward. Now, again, in India, uh, uh, I think uh, that is uh, great strides that uh, Indian ophthalmology is making that this particular, uh, basically this is the procedure that you have uh, when you are looking at the same procedure. You can see this, uh, there, there is this cyclotorsion that you can do. You can see this is a cyclotorsion after docking and the GUI can also move where, where you can make the centration which is, uh, which is there. Again, the procedure remains about the same which is that you do the posterior cut. Uh, 16 seconds, you see this is the posterior cut that is happening. Then you do uh, the side cut which is there. And then uh, you have the anterior which is coming. And then you have the entry cut which is there. So this is uh, basically what you have uh, in different machines, which is there. Uh, in the real, uh, in the uh, for before it started, this relax then went on to smile. So relax was where you would make a flap and take out the lenticule, and then you are looking in this particular case that you have moved in the smile to the smile pro from a 200 kilohertz to a 500 to an 800. The scanning patterns have been changed. The energies have been lowered so that the cornea are pristine clear the next particular day. So today when you look at the uh, Kalex, uh, uh, I think uh, these are the commercially available systems that are available, the 500, the 800, the Femto, and the, or, and the ATOS Twin and the Alita. And you can see that progressively the quantum of energy that has been released onto the cornea has, has decreased. You can see that the energy per pulse is pretty low. Uh, this is the fastest laser, the Vizumax Pro, which is the, the 800, and you have a 16 second. The patient interface are different uh, from a curved interface, you have gone on to a flat interface. Cyclotorsion compensation is today available in most of the systems except the earlier Vizumax because that was a problem. Inbuilt centration or a manual centration is also available and that has improved the results further. Now, uh, silk uh, is something the first uh, the Elita, first Elita was fired globally in 2018 and again there was a learning the day the uh, first patient we did. Uh, you can see this was a flap, we started with a flap. The first patient that we did, uh, there was some issues that were there. Look at this. They started with a 3 millimeter, sorry, a 2 millimeter movement around and then the side cut and then the cut which is the bed cut. What did it result in? It resulted the OBL this of this 2 millimeter did not allow the cut which was on the bed to extend to the periphery and we could not get a good separation. Small little learning that you have to really do the, the transaction of the bed first and then do the side cut. But again, these are learnings and this is how evolution has happened. Uh, first silk procedure performed on 4th of January during COVID times 2020. And uh, this is uh, uh, again looking at the dimensions being slightly different. Whether you want a plano convex lenticule or you want a biconvex lenticule, and creation of a biconvex lenticule possibly may reduce the higher order abrasions which are there. And there, the spot size being reduced from 4 micron to 1 micron with no spot and line separation. Today, we have reduced the energy settings which were at 50 nanotubes to 41, 42. And tomorrow we want to have a spot separation also. And the numerical approach, aperture, etc. Some micron procedure. Now the question that arises is why this shift from excimer to a lenticule with this thing? When you are working with an excimer, you have the cosine effect with you because you have a cornea which is curved and the, cord, the laser which is firing at the par paracentral uh, area or the periphery area may not be right plan uh, planar as it is supposed to be. The second thing is the environmental conditions of the uh, of humidity temperature as also the quality of the optics will have a direct impact on the burn on the cornea okay but when you are looking at a calyx it is essentially just the focusing mechanism of the femtosecond the numerical apertures and how precise is your focusing and focusing is always more precise with less error than a burn with an excimer laser so therefore there is a shift which is happening in this particular case uh, the results of silk have been uh, testing and now it's commercially available which have been approved. So, refractive surgery as regards the cornea moving on, uh, there have been talks as to pre-selection of candidates and when you are looking at pre-selection of candidates, the topography is an essential tool wherein you also need to look at the posterior floor. 
but then there are the indications where you have problems in these kind of cases whether you would want to do a laser vision correction or not and the new dimension that has come in is what is known as the extra procedures and the extra procedures actually were started by Evidro and in the extra procedures all that you have to do is whether you have made a flap or uh, you have done a lenticule you would put the Vivex dye and once you have put the Vivex dye we could get absorbed into the cornea and then uh, so then you would go ahead and do the uh, UV light uh, which is uh, which has to be here. so this is a sub minimal this is less than the cross linking uh, dose that we are giving for the patients who have keratoconus so this is again something that is done for borderline corneas now let us come to some innovations in Kalex uh, part of them were mentioned by uh, uh, by uh, Tushya uh, but you have these innovations where earlier there was uh, people were dreading that there is uh, lenticular dissection problems etc etc addressing astigmatism tackling complications and how do you do retreatment etc so this is uh, what has been uh, coming on so you have what is known as a meniscus sign you can see here you can see this particular lip that has been created and this is called as a meniscus sign so this clearly shows that you are in the posterior plane uh, this sign again is the white ring sign which you can see this is the white ring that is created so you can again know whether the side cuts are fine or not and go ahead and do this uh, this is again uh, being described uh, by Sajdev uh, et al. with Asha. so this is essentially called as the stop sign so you are seeing this is again small little innovations when you are in two different planes can you see this resistance so this is called a stop sign if it was in the same plane you would not get any resistance and you would just go through so this is a stop sign which has been described and if you have retained lenticules this is the kind of problem that you can have uh, where you can have astigmatic uh, topography etc and all that you have to do is to be very careful and maybe a pure simple hydration of the lenticule you will be able to see as to where the lenticule is but the key idea is do not cut on a dry cornea the cornea should be slightly moist if you don't have and the energy setting should be fantastic so you can go ahead and take it again uh, described uh, by Gitanjar uh, Siddhev at all and this is use of triamcelone when you have this problem you can just put triamcelone and again a small innovation for you to see if there is a retained reticule or not uh, described by Dityal at all the use of Pintrop, OCT you can even go back and take the patient in the OPD onto the OCT to see whether there is a reticule you can see this is the reticule which is there and you can go ahead and take it now if you have a reticule which is retained or you want to do a retreatment uh, this has been referred to, I am not sure whether somebody uh, actually showed a video but you have the cap becoming a flap so you will make a cap into a flap and this is a simple procedure that you can do uh, you can see here uh, inner cut going out then you are making an outer cut and you can see in this particular case that you will be easy enough it's like a donut uh, you can just leave it, you can see that this is the area from where you had the lenticule which was removed and then you go ahead and do the laser ablation or you can do a PRK in this particular case. Now again innovative uses of lenticule have been described uh, when you have thin corneas, uh, I think uh, Gaurav, Dr. Dhami were uh, amongst the first to start cross in India but earlier there was a Lakshman Rekha that you wouldn't do a cornea which was less than 460 microns because it could have deleterious effects. So hypotonic uh, uh, saline came in, uh, you could uh, use uh, contact lenses but again from the lenticule what we have described is that you can tailor make the thickness of a, of a lenticule that means if I have a 2 micron, a 2 diopter, uh, I would have a 30 micron or a 35 micron lenticule and if I have a thickness which is 430 I will use a, a 30 micron so you can tailor make if you have a minus 8 or a minus 10 you would have a lenticule which would be 100 micron so if you have a cornea which is 360 you can use that this has been published and we have been doing it from 2015 that you have a lenticule freshly available lenticule and use that for cross linking uh, again we have used these uh, lenticules with the intacts or the intracordial ring segments for cases of keratoconus to be taken care of again the lenticule has been used this is Shirikanesh at all for uh, using a lenticule called a spiri that is myopic lenticule make a pocket and put the myopic lenticule to correct hyperopia but I think this is a commercial uh, technique you are going to have the hyperopic uh, 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 lenticule extraction pretty soon 
Again, the lenticule has been used for keratoconus. You can use a lenticule, make a pocket, and there is an additive effect, and you can use it for keratoconus. Now, finally, friends, these are the cordial kind of things which are going on. And let us come on to the lens base, which again, uh, uh, because of uh, the level to which you should remove cordial tissue. When we started LASIK, we would do minus 18. I don't know, Dr. Hami, I don't know what was your, but when we started in 1998, there was no limit that was set. So you could uh, look at the cordial thickness, etc., and keep it there, and the patient are still doing pretty well. So, uh, so you look minus 16, minus 18, but now the thing has come down because the quality of vision goes down, and you have to go ahead from going ahead from a subtractive surgery to an additive surgery. In laser vision correction, you are subtracting something from the cornea. Rather than that, do an additive surgery, and that is like some people keep it at minus eight, some people keep it at minus ten. Uh, in Germany, it is uh, beyond the law to do uh, lasers more than minus eight. So those are limits that have been set and then you look at the fake intraocular lenses or the implants. Uh, I think India is the only other company, uh, uh, only other country apart from Star ICL where you have three or four companies which are giving you the implantable lens. Again, uh, Made in India, India is doing pretty great in that. Implantable collagen lenses, you have the holes which have come in and you are just wanting to correct both the toric and the uh, spherical variety, just a simple case, you can put it, I will just go through it fast because uh, you just need an alignment of the lens which is there. Now something that we have not explored to that extent in India is the use of bioptics. Bioptics is the combination or even trioptics where there is a combination of two to three technologies together. You could cross-link a cornea, you could put an intax in that patient and at the end of it you can do an ICL. Or you can combine a lens based procedure along with a procedure which is uh, working on the cornea. So that is bioptics and we are under we are under utilizing the power of bioptics even in our patients of press biopic cataracts. When you are have a dissatisfied patient with a trifocal lens or with another lens or with a uh, with the uh, in need of lens etc. The first thing you see if there is a refractive error, give the patient glasses, let the patient be, if the patient is satisfied, go ahead and do a LASIK on top of it. There's absolutely no problem on that, but this is something that I want to stress that bioptics is a technique that is there. The final frontier I would say in refractive surgery today is the correction of press biopia. All of us who are above 40 uh, uh, do have a problem in near bleeding uh, and that is the problem you can either work on the cornea or you can work on the lens. Uh, this is the press beyond where you have a blend zone which is a monovision plus induction of spherical abrasions. Uh, looking at the abrasion profile and seeing how changing the abrasion profile can give you great things is where you are working on the press beyond etc. But you again have the lens based option which is again been introduced again in India you have which is the uh, ICLs which are available or the implantable lens which have an EDOF on it or a spherical abrasion or even we have the uh, trifocality on it. And refractive lens exchange, uh, especially for hypermobile patients uh, who are also having a uh, lot of talk about dysfunctional lens uh, index, uh, in these cases you could do a refractive lens exchange it is there. And finally, we are also looking uh, at the use of the good old pilocarpine that we had uh, reduced to about a 1% pilocarpine uh, causing a pinhole effect and that pinhole effect giving you near vision and this is going to be also available commercially very soon in India otherwise you can in your own pharmacy do the dilution. Uh, there are drugs that, we are, that uh, people are working about, this is the EV06 uh, which uh, is a proprietary drug which is lipoic acid choline ester which will work on the enzymes on the lens fibers. Uh, which chemically reduce the lipoic acid to active form of dihydrolipoic and that brings back the elasticity of the lens which is there. And finally friends I would say for the uh, for the irregular astigmatism that you have, uh, you have again intracornial ring segments again from India I would say uh, irregular astigmatism you have cares which has been described by Susan uh, wherein instead of a plastic segment you are using the, uh, the uh, tissue of a cornea uh, to change the arc length and this could, this was approved for uh, myopia but now it is being used for keratoconus or eclectic diseases of the cornea. This is the femtosecond uh, it gives you 
uh, pretty good channels. You can just go in, uh, uh, make the channels which are there, and then you can put in the intracordial ring segments depending upon how much is the astigmatism. Uh, just put a suture at the end of the procedure, and uh, this will be anchored, used as a uh, anchor and uh, remove the suture. This reduces the asymmetry of a patient and it also reduces the uh, uh, the need for uh, contact lenses in all the cases. But again, these are learning and this is how evolution has happened. Uh, first self procedure performed on 4th of January during COVID times 2020 and uh, this is uh, uh, again looking at the dimensions being slightly different whether you want a plano convex lenticule or you want a biconvex lenticule and creation of a biconvex lenticule possibly may reduce the higher order abrasions which are there and there the spot size being reduced from 4 micron to 1 micron with no spot and line separation today we have reduced the energy settings which were at 50 nanotubes to 41, 42 and tomorrow we want to have a spot separation also and the numerical approach, aperture etc some micron procedure now the question that arises is why this shift from excimer to a lenticule with this thing when you are working with an excimer you have the cosine effect with you because you have a cornea which is curved and the, cord, the laser which is firing at the par paracentral uh, area or the periphery area may not be right plan uh, planar as it is supposed to be the second thing is the environmental conditions of the uh, of humidity temperature as also the quality of the optics will have a direct impact on the burn on the cornea okay but when you are looking at a calyx it is essentially just the focusing mechanism of the femtosecond the numerical apertures and how precise is your focusing and focusing is always more precise with less error than a burn with an excimer laser so therefore there is a shift which is happening in this particular case uh, the results of Sengi have been uh, testing and now it's commercially available which have been approved. So, refractive surgery as regards the cornea moving on, uh, there have been talks as to pre-selection of candidates and when you are looking at pre-selection of candidates, the topography is an essential tool wherein you also need to look at the posterior floor. But then there are the indications where you have problems in these kind of cases, whether you would want to do a laser vision correction or not. And the new dimension that has come in is what is known as the extra procedures and the extra procedures actually were started by Evidro and in the extra procedures all that you have to do is whether you have made a flap or uh, you have done a lenticule, you would put the Vivex dye and once you have put the Vivex dye you could get absorbed into the cornea and then uh, so then you would go ahead and do the uh, UV light uh, which is uh, which has to be here so this is a sub minimal this is less than the cross linking uh, dose that we are giving for the patients who have keratoconus so this is again something that is done for borderline corneas now let us come to some innovations in calyx uh, part of them were mentioned by uh, uh, by uh, tushya uh, but you have these innovations where earlier there was uh, people were dreading that there is uh, lenticular dissection problems etc etc addressing astigmatism, tackling complications and how do you do retreatment etc. So this is uh, what has been uh, coming on. So you have what is known as a meniscus sign. You can see here, you can see this particular lip that has been created and this is called as a meniscus sign. So this clearly shows that you are in the posterior plane. Uh, this sign again is the white ring sign which you can see. This is the white ring that is created. So you can again know whether the side cuts are fine or not and go ahead and do this. Uh, this is again uh, being described uh, by Sajdev uh, et al. with Asha. So this is essentially called as the stop sign. So you are seeing this is again small little innovations. When you are in two different planes, can you see this resistance? So this is called a stop sign. If it was in the same plane, you would not get any resistance and you would just go through. So this is a stop sign which has been described. And if you have retained lenticules, this is the kind of problem that you can have uh, where you can have astigmatic uh, topography, etc. And all that you have to do is to be very careful and maybe a pure simple hydration of the lenticule you will be able to see as to where the lenticule is. But the key idea is do not cut on a dry cornea. The cornea should be slightly moist if you don't have and the energy setting should be fantastic so you can go ahead and take it again. Uh, describe 
uh, by Gitanjali uh, Sitdev at all, and this is use of triamcinolone. When you have this problem, you can just put triamcinolone, and again a small elevation for you to see if there is a retained reticule or not. Uh, described by Dityal at all, the use of Pintra, OCT, you can even go back and take the patient in the OPD onto the OCT to see whether there is a lenticule, you can see this is the lenticule which is there and you can go ahead and take it. Now, if you have a lenticule which is retained or you want to do a retreatment, uh, this has been referred to, I am not sure whether somebody uh, actually showed a video, but you have the cap becoming a flap, so you will make a cap into a flap and this is a simple procedure that you can do, uh, you can see here, uh, inner cut going out, then you are making an outer cut and you can see in this particular case that you will be easy enough, it's like a donut, uh, you can just leave it, you can see that this is the area from where you had the lenticule which was removed and then you go ahead and do the laser ablation or you can do a PRK in this particular case. Now again, innovative uses of lenticule have been described uh, when you have thin corneas, uh, I think uh, Gaurav, Dr. Dhami were uh, amongst the first to start cross in India, but earlier there was a Lakshman Rekha that you wouldn't do a cornea which was less than 460 microns because it could have deleterious effects. So hypotonic uh, uh, saline came in, uh, you could uh, use uh, contact lenses. But again from the lenticule, what we have described is that you can tailor make the thickness of a, of a lenticule. That means if I have a 2 micron, a 2 diopter, uh, I would have a 30 micron or a 35 micron lenticule. And if I have a thickness which is 430, I will use a, a 30 micron. So you can tailor make if you have a minus 8 or a minus 10, you would have a lenticule which would be 100 micron. So if you have a cornea which is 360, you can use that. This has been published and we have been doing it from 2015 that you have a lenticule, freshly available lenticule and use that for cross-linking. Uh, again, we have used these uh, lenticules with the intacts or the intracordial ring segments for cases of keratoconus to be taken care of. Again, the lenticule has been used, this is Shri Ganesh et al. for uh, using a lenticule called a Spiri, that is myopic lenticule, make a pocket and put the myopic lenticule to correct hyperopia, but I think this is a commercial uh, technique. You are going to have the hyperopic uh, 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 lenticule extraction pretty soon. Again, the lenticule has been used for keratoconus. You can use a lenticule, make a pocket and there is an additive effect and you can use it for keratoconus. Now finally friends, these are the cordial kind of things which are going on. And let us come on to the lens base, which again, uh, uh, because of uh, the level to which you should remove corneal tissue. When we started LASIK, we would do minus 18. I don't know, Dr. Hami, I don't know what was your, but when we started in 1998, there was no limit that was set. So you could uh, look at the corneal thickness, etc., and keep it there, and the patient are still doing pretty well. So, uh, so you look minus 16, minus 18, but now the thing has come down because the quality of vision goes down and you have to go ahead from going ahead from a subtractive surgery to an additive surgery. In laser vision correction, you are subtracting something from the cornea rather than that do an additive surgery and that is like some people keep it at minus 8, some people keep it at minus 10. Uh, in Germany, it is uh, beyond the law to do uh, lasers more than minus 8. So those are limits that have been set and then you look at the fake intraocular lenses or the implants. Uh, I think India is the only other company, uh, uh, only other country apart from Star ICL where you have three or four companies which are giving you the implantable lens. Again, uh, Made in India, India is doing pretty great in that. Implantable collagen lenses, you have the holes which have come in and you are just wanting to correct both the toric and the uh, spherical variety, just a simple case, you can put it, I will just go through it fast because uh, you just need an alignment of the lens which is there. Now something that we have not explored to that extent in India is the use of bioptics. Bioptics is the combination or even trioptics where there is a combination of two to three technologies together. You could cross-link a cornea, you could put an intax in that patient and at the end of it you can do an ICL or you can combine a lens based procedure along with a procedure which is uh, working on the cornea so that is bioptics and we are under we are under utilizing the power of bioptics even in our patients of press biopic cataracts 
when you are have a dissatisfied patient with a trifocal lens or with another lens or with a uh, with the uh, in need of lens etc the first thing you see if there is a refractive error give the patient glasses let the patient be the patient is satisfied go ahead and do a lasik on top of it there is absolutely no problem on that but this is something that i want to stress that bioptics is a technique that is there the final frontier i would say in refractive surgery today is the correction of press biopsia all of us who are about 40 uh, uh, do have a problem in near bleeding uh, and that is the problem you can either work on the cornea or you can work on the lens uh, this is the press beyond where you have a blank zone which is a mono vision plus induction of spherical abrasions uh, looking at the abrasion profile and seeing how changing the abrasion profile can give you great things is where you are working on the press beyond etc but you again have the lens based option which is again been introduced again in india you have which is the uh, icls which are available or the implantable lens which have an ed of on it or a spherical abrasion or even we have the a uh, trifocality on it and refractive lens exchange uh, especially for hypermobile patients uh, who are also having a uh, lot of talk about dysfunctional lens uh, index uh, in these cases you could do a refractive lens exchange is there and finally we are also looking uh, at the use of the good old pilocarpine that we had uh, reduced to about a 1% pilocarpine uh, causing a pinhole effect and that pinhole effect giving you near vision and this is going to be also available commercially very soon in india whether it is within in your own pharmacy to the dilution uh, there are drugs that we are that uh, people are working about this is the ev06 Uh, which uh, is a proprietary drug, which is like oic acid, choline ester, which will work on the enzymes on the lens fibers, uh, which chemically reduces the lipoic acid to active form of dihydrolipoic, and that brings back the elasticity of the lens, which is there. And finally, friends, I would say for the uh, for the irregular astigmatism that you have, uh, you have again intracornea ring segments. Again, from India, I would say uh, irregular astigmatism. You have cares, which has been. Described by Susan, uh, wherein instead of a plastic segment, you are using the uh, the uh, tissue of a cornea uh, to change the arc length, and this was this was approved for uh, myopia, but now it is being used for keratoconus or eclectic diseases of the cornea. This is the femtosecond. Uh, it gives you uh, pretty good channels. You can just go in, uh, uh, make the channels which are there, and then you can put in the intracorneal ring segments depending upon how much is the astigmatism. Uh, just put a suture at the end of the procedure, and uh, this will be anchored, used as a uh, anchor, and uh, remove the suture. This reduces the asymmetry of a patient, and it also reduces the uh, uh, the need for uh, contact lenses in all the cases. Even dry optics, where there is a combination of two to three technologies together, you could crosslink a cornea, you could put an intact in that patient, and at the end of it you can do an icl or you can combine a lens based procedure along with a procedure which is uh, working on the cornea so that is bioptics and we are under we are under utilizing the power of bioptics even in our patients of press biopic cataracts when you are have a dissatisfied patient with a trifocal lens or with another lens or with a uh, with the uh, in need of lens etc the first thing you to see if there is a refractive error give the patient glasses let the patient be if the patient is satisfied go ahead and do a lasik on top of it there is absolutely no problem on that but this is something that i want to stress that bioptics is a technique that is there the final frontier i would say in refractive surgery today is the correction of press biopsia all of us who are above 40 uh, uh, do have a problem in near bleeding uh, and that is the problem you can either work on the cornea or you can work on the lens uh, this is the press beyond where you have a blank zone which is a mono vision plus induction of spherical abrasions uh, looking at the abrasion profile and seeing how changing the abrasion profile can give you great things is where you are working on the press beyond etc but you again have the lens based option which is again been introduced again in india you have which is the Uh, ICLs which are available, or the implantable lens which have an ED of on it, or a spherical abrasion, or even we have the uh, trifocality on it, and refractive lens exchange, uh, especially for hypermobile patients uh, who are also having a uh, lot has been talked about dysfunctional lens uh, index. Uh, in these cases, you could do a refractive lens exchange. It is there. 
and finally we are also looking uh, at the use of the good old pilocarpine that we had uh, reduced to about a 1% pilocarpine uh, causing a pinhole effect and that pinhole effect giving you near vision and this is going to be also available commercially very soon in India otherwise you can in your own pharmacy do the dilution. Uh, there are drugs that we are that uh, people are working about. This is the EV06, uh, which uh, is a proprietary drug, which is lipoic acid choline ester, which can work on the enzymes on the lens fibers, uh, which chemically reduce the lipoic acid to active form of dihydrolipoic, and that brings back the elasticity of the lens, which is there. And finally, friends, I would say for the uh, for the irregular astigmatism that you have, uh, you have again intracorneal ring segments again from India I would say uh, irregular astigmatism you have cares which has been described by Susan uh, wherein instead of a plastic segment you are using the uh, the uh, tissue of a cornea uh, to change the arc length and this could this was approved for uh, myopia but now it is being used for keratoconus or ectatic diseases of the cornea this is the femtosecond uh, it gives you uh, pretty good channels you can just go in uh, uh, make the channels which are there and then you can put in the intracorneal ring segments depending upon how much is the astigmatism uh, just put a suture at the end of the procedure and uh, this will be anchor, used as a uh, anchor and uh, remove the suture this reduces the asymmetry of a patient and it also reduces the uh, uh, the need for uh, contact lenses in all the cases and the final frontier I would say in refractive surgery is that the merging of cataract surgery with the refractive surgery. Cataract surgery is no longer today a restorative surgery. Uh, you had the era of camps where you would go do a surgery and give the patient a plus 10 glass irrespective of whatever it was and the patient was pretty happy. Nobody is happy today with a plus 10 glass. You are looking at target emetropia, spectacle independence and there is where the cataract surgery has merged into a refractive surgery. So there is a close bond today between cataract and refractive surgery. Patient wants to be encumbrance free and that is where we are targeting the, the every cataract surgery to be a refractive surgery today. Uh, with the IOL masters and the other techniques that are available of good uh, uh, IOL uh, corrections, majority, a significant large majority of our patients are within 0 0.25, 0 0.5 diopters of zero. And this is, friends, uh, I would say a great, great uh, movement which has gone on forwards. Uh, so this is, uh, I would say, once you have uh, better quality intraocular lenses, I personally feel cornea will not be the way for correcting breast myopia. As the lenses quality improve, uh, target hematropia for all patients, and I would think that uh, maybe within the next five to ten years, you would uh, not be having press biops amongst us and uh, refractive lens exchange will go forward. Uh, there is uh, the work which is going on on refractive index shaping which is the concept of uh, shaping or changing the refractive index of the intraocular implant that has been put by using femtosecond laser by making a spherical abrasion within the lens which is there and this again is something to, and you had the light available lenses which were there. Lyric is another concept where you are using the femtosecond laser. The femtosecond laser has been used to make small peripheral incisions within the crystalline lens as also now it is being used to make these uh, small things. Again, the concept is spherical abrasion. Spherical abrasion, whether it can help you get the depth of perception and whether it is able to get you uh, the breast biopic correction and this can be used for various things. So friends, I would say uh, interesting, exciting times where refractive surgery is a rapidly evolving field. It is not something which has happened and closed and done and dusted. I think there will be new and exciting new things that will be coming in refractive surgery. There are unlimited options that people are working on. And I would say that technological innovations are going to lead us to the quest for perfection in this journey for refractive surgery that we have had so far. Thank you very much for your time.